Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to whoever is uh, tuning in today from, from the UK and Europe. And good morning for uh, everyone that is uh, watching us from, from the United States. Um, we'll be partnering today with uh, Neota Logic uh, on no code, no problem, building bespoke legal solutions to serve your uh, business um, roundtable plus a case study that will be delivered straight after the, the round table. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers joining us uh, this this afternoon. Uh, we've got uh, Lindsay Haller, uh, who is VP Knowledge Management and Information Governance at uh, AIG. We've got uh, uh, Lindsay Fry, as, who is a Technology Manager at Travelers, uh, as well as Jack uh, Stanovsek, Director of Client Solutions and Engagement at Neota. Um, I will pass the word to our speakers first, uh, starting with Julie, just to quickly uh, introduce uh, themselves, and then we'll start with uh, our panel questions. Uh, Julie, over to you. Sure. So, again, Julie Heller uh, with AIG. I am responsible for knowledge management and information governance strategies, and uh, I've actually known some of the folks at Neota for a number of years, and prior lives and uh, looking forward to this discussion today and, you know, learning from my peers and also sharing, you know, sharing any insights that I can offer. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Lindsay Fry at uh, Travelers. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Fry. I am a technology manager of a team of software engineers at Traveler, so I'm sure we have a lot of operations folks here, but my team partners very closely with the corporate legal operations group at Travelers. So um, my function really supports the entire corporate legal department. So we are responsible for all of the technologies, including Neota, who we've been partnering with for a couple years now. So I'm very honored and happy to be here. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Jack Stanovsek at uh, Neota Logic. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack. I am the Director of Markets and Growth at Neota Logic. Uh, by way of background, I started off my career as a lawyer, uh, so I certainly know law firms pretty well. I uh, moved across to the tech space in Neota's client success team, where I built out um, a lot of kind of sophisticated applications for clients. So I, I really know the platform well, and I mentioned that just because if you have any questions about that, uh, any particular use cases that you want to know if Neota's done before, uh, by all means, put that in the chat and I can advise uh, a yay or a nay. Uh, but really excited to be joining everyone today. I think it's going to be a great discussion. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Timo. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Cosmonauts, as uh, well as the uh, CEO of uh, Pekama. I'll be the chair uh, of the session today. And uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, my first question uh, to both Lindsay and Julie, um, which is very, very kind of straightforward, simple question. What does no code technology mean to you? Maybe we start with Julie. Sure. So let me preface my comments today with a little bit of a disclaimer that I'm sure you've all heard before, but I'm speaking um, from my, you know, professional experience and not directly on behalf of my employer. Um, so what I would say no code means to me um, is really uh, the ability to put together uh, workable solutions that do not require advanced technological training or skill um, and that, you know, no code can be used across many different industries, but, you know, specifically for legal, which is where we sit, um, there are many, I think, many opportunities for automation. Um, and I think we owe it to ourselves across our industry to, you know, to leverage existing tools and platforms um, to be more efficient and to bring greater consistency to work product. And before we continue with Lindsay, I've just put forward uh, our first uh, poll question to our audience. Do you have an understanding of no code technology? You can simply answer with yes or no. Uh, over to you, Lindsay. Sure. So uh, putting my technology cap on, um, when you think about software engineering and development, oftentimes you think about the very traditional coding process. And while that's definitely 
definitely still effective and should be used for certain business cases. What we've found, and in my experience, what I've found is that these no-code solutions are a great supplement to that you know, custom development type work. Um, so to Julie's earlier point, workflow automation, particularly no or low code workflow automation is wonderful for the legal community because it allows you to obviously increase that speed to market for whatever solution, whatever sort of business process that you're, you're trying to address. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the hands of an engineer. It can be in the hands of the legal department um, themselves, which is, which is great. But what I've learned as well with no code is that you still have to do um, a fair amount of planning and upfront work to make sure that the no code solution you're building is going to be effective and meet the needs of your business partners. So you still have to do that system design, that requirements gathering, really just the planning upfront, because what you don't want to happen is down the road, you've started because it's no code, it's really fast, you can move really quickly. And then you're like, okay, well, now I have to go back and rework everything because I didn't really do the upfront legwork. And I know the upfront legwork might sound a little intimidating, but it's not. It's just basically putting a plan together and really outlining your objectives before you're really getting hands-on. So again, I love no-code development. Um, I think that the upfront work is really key. And what we've also found at Travelers is if we don't have to focus on that no code work and we can use Neota or whatever workflow automation platform to streamline that upfront development process, we can actually focus on maybe some more complex technical integrations or downstream processes to not only target the business process that you're looking at, but also any business processes that follow after whatever your solution, whatever solution you're building with workflow automation. So um, if you have those technical resources, obviously that's a benefit, but um, if you don't, no code is still uh, a wonderful place to be. And Jack, slightly differently structured question to you. What is a no code platform? Yeah, uh, very good question. So I definitely echo um, both Julie and Lindsay's understanding. Um, but for us, what really sets apart a no-code platform is putting the power of software development into the hands of subject matter experts. Um, and that concept in and of itself is quite powerful for us because it eliminates the need for subject matter experts to translate their requirements into code for a developer to implement. Um, so you don't have to have anything lost in translation that might not hit your specs uh, directly and precisely as you like. Because you have the power to code in your hands, uh, you're able to create that automated application and automated workflow to your specifications. Uh, the, the other aspect of no code that you mentioned was a platform. Uh, so not only do you have, have the ability to build out these you know, sophisticated applications, but because it is a platform, you can really use it any way that you like. Um, so clients use our um, platform for internal processes. They use it to uh, build out products that they sell to the market. They use it to build out products for maybe their clients um, to address a points-based solution and prove that they're a really good business partner. Um, and then within you know, those general categories, you can use it in basically any sector. So the platform aspect is also really powerful as well. Thank you, Jack. Um, and just to kind of finalize this question, uh, our, our poll is suggesting that 65% of the total audience today uh, has some understanding of no code technology, but about 35% has zero understanding. So still a lot of people out there uh, that, that they're still wondering what no code is and what it, uh, what it can do for them. So on to, uh, our next question and, uh, I'll revert that, uh, back to, um, the other participants on the panel. Uh, what was the trigger event that prompted you to seek improvement of your existing legal workflow, Lindsay? Sure. So I think as we looked at the legal department and we have a lot of different functions in a corporate legal organization, as I'm sure most of the audience is aware of mostly um, as corporate, corporate legal employees, but we found that our customers were coming to us and telling us that, um, and customers being our corporate legal employees were coming to my team and telling us we have a lot of repetitive 
um, low complexity tasks that it would just be great to use technology to automate because then that gives our resources more time to focus on more complex, higher value work, which is really at the end of the day, a great thing for the business. It's a great thing for the organization, the culture, the employee. There is no lack of benefit to automating high repetition, um, low complexity processes. And so that was really the trigger event for us to consider workflow automation. Um, but as we found, and as I'll speak during my presentation of, is that you don't only have to target those high repetitive, low complexity tasks, and you can start to analyze across the board, okay, what else makes a good use case? What else can we automate in order to accomplish our, our department goals? Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and before I move on to Julie, I would like to put forward our next question. Uh, to our audience. Do you have any current plans to automate workflows, documents, or expertise in the next 12 months? Again, it's a simple yes or no question. And in the meantime, I would like to ask Julie, um, how do you identify the areas of your legal operations suitable uh, for uh, automation? So, Lindsay has already uh, highlighted one area, which is the high volume, low complexity tasks. Um, another, you know, another area is um, the repetitive, but perhaps more complicated um, thing. And, you know, one of the areas that in, in my career, in my past five, seven years, we have taken an opportunity to automate um, is the submission of um, statements of work and budgets and that we have um, some tools that we've built out. Um, we're not using Neoto, but it's you know similar, uh, similar powerful platform to uh, build in workflow with you know various decision trees as to um, you know where things need to go depending on what kind of information, where it's coming from, which type of business it affects. So you know the logic of that was not too complicated, but um, you know that's just another example. I think that you know you can be focused on what the lawyers need, but there's also within legal operations, I think many of us have um, colleagues in legal ops who are responsible for, you know, whether it's um, accruals or, you know, things having to do with interacting with our outside counsel, where there's a lot of back and forth and, you know, automating those interactions. Um, not only is it more efficient, but it also gives consistent data across many different inputs. So... Thank you, Julie. That was really insightful. Um, Jack, a question, a question to you. Um, and I think that's a question that is probably on the top list of a lot of our listeners today. How does a no-code solution compare to an off-the-shelf solution? What are the benefits? Uh, what are uh, what are the cons? Yep. Uh, so when we talk about off-the-shelf or point-based solutions, we really have products that have been pre-developed and then on sold to clients. And maybe there's a little bit of customization that's built into it, uh, but it's essentially it's what you see is what you get. Um, you have a little bit of opportunity to customize it to your firm's likings, but that's about it. Um, oftentimes that's really, really effective. So things like e-discovery, um, uh, digital solutions uh, for that particular use case, uh, an out of the box solution is more than appropriate because the process of work is gonna be very consistent across law firms and perhaps in-house legal if they have the team for it. Uh, but when we talk about no code platforms, what we're really talking about is hyper customized customizable applications and digital solutions. Um, so it's both customizable in the sense that you can really get almost all of the functionality that you would like out of the digital offering, uh, but it's also uh, customizable in design. So how the application looks and feels to the end user, you can get really, really close to your firm's styling guides uh, using a platform that allows for it. Um, the other thing that you would want to consider when doing um, making the choice between off the shelf or um, a, a platform uh, do you have the resources uh, to dedicate to building out the solution yourself or do you really need it done for you? Um, so if you're um, at a place where you've gotten um, budget and approval to actually go for it and build it out yourself because you need something really specific to satisfy your business needs, then absolutely go for a platform. 
Uh, if you perhaps are able to compromise with whatever the out-of-box out-of-the-box solutions are, are that make it give you 60 to 80 percent, then maybe it, that's the best solution for you. So that's the key um, kind of different differentiating factor for me. Would it be right to assume that perhaps it may take longer to set up a, a, um, a, a, a kind of a no-code solution, but the adoption process followed? Uh, after that initial uh, setup is shorter, whereas with off-the-shelf solution, perhaps the initial setup is much shorter, but but then adoption takes a lot longer because you said that you know those kind of no-code solution can get us closer as possible to existing solution, perhaps that are already adopted or processes that are uh, in, in line with the department that you're servicing. Yeah, I think Lindsay's point when she first started speaking about um, consultation of your stakeholders is really important in terms of adoption. So if you have not consulted with your stakeholders at all, and it's the first time they're seeing the digital solution, um, I can almost guarantee that they're going to want changes, and those changes are not going to be minor. Um, so putting in that legwork of creating a project plan, uh, both in terms of you know um, how you're going to build out the application, but also who you're going to speak to, um, how often you're going to show demos and receive feedback, what would be considered in scope and out of scope. Those are all really, really important considerations when it comes to adoption. Awesome. Uh, there's also, sorry, the, the consideration of, you know, if you're getting an out of the box solution, is this really a band aid for a knife wound? Is this something that you're going to need to replace in maybe two or three years time uh, that's just sufficient for the time being? Thank you, Jack. Um, just to formalize our poll question, do you have any current plans to automate workflows, documents, or expertise in the next 12 months? 63% of our audience says yes, 36 says no. I'm going to end that poll now. Uh, and before I move on to the next one, um, I will now ask um, Jack again, how does Neota compare to other no-code platforms, both focused on legal and not? Yep. Um, so I'll focus on the second part of that question first. In terms of uh, you know where we sit in terms of industry, uh, certainly Neota's target has been um, law firms and uh, more recently in-house legal teams. Um, and that's kind of due to the nature of how the company was founded. We were founded by two lawyers that were pretty high up at different firms. So we really knew law firms and we knew in-house legal quite well. Um, so it just played to our strengths to kind of target those as um, uh, target prospects. Uh, but in terms of the tools, if you look at the tools themselves, and even if you look at the practice of law or legal operations, what you're doing is uh, creating workflows, creating documents that need to either be approved or rejected, um, and getting people to sign them. That's essentially what it comes down to when we look at what our technology is doing. Uh, those things are agnostic to the legal industry. They can be applied to a lot of different areas. Um, so certainly we think that we can expand outwards. Uh, how we are positioned in relation to our competitors. Um, so like I said, we are a platform. We're not an out-of-the-box solution. But we do have kind of building blocks to get you maybe 20 to 30% of the way there. Uh, we really leave it up to you to build out your use case uh, in consultation with, um, of course, uh, personnel from Neota. Um, and we really shine in uh, uh, three pillars of automation, the first being expertise automation. Um, so that's the idea of replicating um, the process where someone knocks on a lawyer's door, the lawyer asks them questions, and then provides them advice at the end of that session. Uh, we put that into a web form uh, where the web form will ask you certain questions or direct you down certain pathways, uh, depending on what the user answers upstream. They'll be directed to the appropriate advice downstream. Uh, the second pillar is document automation, which I'm sure most people know about. Uh, so the idea that you don't have to have um, a, uh, a client fill out a Word document themselves, or even you don't have to fill it out yourself for the first draft. You can put it into a web format, uh, and then the user's answers that they put into the web fields will automatically populate in a Microsoft Word document that's ready to be reviewed and edited. Uh, and then the final pillar of automation is process automation. Uh, so that's the idea of taking those first two pillars of automation, being expertise and document, document automation, and stringing them together in a seamless and streamlined process. So not only are you knocking on the lawyer's door, door in the form of a web form uh, and receiving advice, but after that session, perhaps an email is sent to trigger another process uh, where another person within the company um, goes into their own web application, reviews the answers from that session, uh, and perhaps reaches out to the client directly. Thank you. And um, a question to 
to Julie and, and Lindsay. Um, what area of your legal operations did you first target with the platform that you've got in place uh, at the minute? Maybe over to you, Julie, first. Sure. Um, I think when we first started using um, no code, low code, it was um, a number of different groups working concurrently in our legal ops um, in department. And so one of the things I mentioned earlier was invoice submission and invoice review. Um, we also, in our e-discovery space, um, in terms of vendor management, we put together a tool, an application, if you will, that would receive monthly metrics from our different e-discovery vendors. And then we fed that into um, a fairly <laughs> uh, robust Excel toolkit for analysis. So that was another workflow that we that we built. Um, so those were so those were sort of the first things that we worked on. So invoices and metrics. Awesome, Julie. And I know that uh, you, Lindsay, is going to go into detail when you're doing your case study, but uh, but you'll be kind of interesting to hear. You know what were the problems that uh, that you experienced. Uh, before you, you, you went in and looked for, uh, for help from the author. Yeah, so I think um, just to add on, on Julie's point, so we started with automation of our NDAs. So again, that high repetition, low complexity contract with document automation. Um, and I think that was a perfect first workflow for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's a pretty common workflow to, to want to automate. Um, across any legal operations division. Two, it allowed us to really explore the use of the platform. So it has that document automation component. It has the integration piece with, for an electronic signature. It has obviously routing and notifications. So we were able to do you know, a pretty routine workflow, but still get the training and experience that we needed to do more complex workflows or even just more workflows um, on the line. So I think, you know, that's a great place to start from my perspective. Um, other considerations, and, and I'll mention this later as well, but just briefly, are to consider anywhere where you can provide um, legal customers self-service opportunities, triage and routing, you know, those, those really manual coordinated efforts that are um, predictable. They have logic driven behind them. Anything that you can do there, document automation, and, and Julie spoke about analytics and reporting as well, but really anywhere where you can standardize the intake of data and then um, ease the coordination after the fact. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, and in the meantime, we've had uh, our third poll question running. Do you currently use or have ever considered using a no-code, low-code platform? 66% of our audience is saying yes. 33% is saying no. Uh, as we end that poll, um, my next question goes to, to Jack. Jack, can you please let us know, do people come to you with a specific problem or uh, do they usually tend to kind of acquire the solution and then and then look for areas within their operation that the, the product can, can solve? Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly have um, plenty of pr prospects that then convert into clients that say, I have a really specific thing that I wanna do, can you do it? Um, and typically the answer is yes, if they've uh, done their research and um, particularly we find with in-house legal teams, they pretty much uh, have legal operators our legal operations teams in house. Uh, so they know the market pretty well and they know what we can offer. Um, so those are really successful use cases where someone comes in and says, I have a very specific idea of what I wanna do. Um, they purchase the subscription and then they go ahead and build it out. We also have people that are just generally interested in um, no code solutions and uh, perhaps they're trying to make a name for themselves at the company or the firm as an, uh, as an innovator. Uh, they onboard Neota. Um, they might do one simple use case first uh, but typically what we find with those clients is as soon as they've um, released an application to production, the company or the firm just has an avalanche of requests coming in to automate different processes. And it, it's a good uh, issue to have because you've certainly demonstrated value and you've de demonstrated that you can do it. Um, but yeah, that's uh, kind of the two uh, areas we see um, are most successful. 
And what would you say is uh, an ideal case scenario to product in, the, in introduction and subsequent adoption? Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Like, what would you say is the ideal case scenario to product introduction and then subsequent adoption? Um, I think more so than having a very clearly defined use case is having um, multiple stakeholders involved in the process, um, having a lot of people engaged um, to an extent. Uh, sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen is a bad thing. Uh, but if you have people that are um, at least in consultation with the C-suite, um, as well as people that are actually going to be building out the application or the solutions yourself, that lends itself to be a very successful product because you get everybody on the same page, you have firm buy-in, you have engagement, and then once the product's released, there's some excitement amongst the company. Um, so we've been running our fourth poll question. In the meantime, do you have legal operation professionals as part of your team? Uh, we've got 57% saying yes, and we've got 42% uh, saying, saying no. Uh, and uh, that will now take me to the last two questions to our panel before we move to uh, the case study that will be presented by, by Lindsay. Uh, a question to you, Julie, and then, and then Lindsay, how do you measure um, innovation impact? How long does it take for you to see an impact of, of a specific technology that, that you, you put in place? How do you measure that impact? So, one of the things I mentioned uh, to a previous question is the the idea of metrics, and you know we're a very metrics driven uh, profession at legal ops. So I think you know having tangible, measurable uh, impact is one thing, but there's also the intangibles, and this is something we talked about during our prep session. Um, Tangible means, you know, there's there are some numbers, you have a baseline, and then you can measure a month, six months later, you know, how much more efficiently are things turning around? Is Have you reduced the time to deliver an output um, to resolve particular challenges? But the intangible, I think, is more um, qualitative. And, you know, I think that's perhaps as much, if not more, of a benefit to um, these kinds of platforms is that, um, you have greater data consistency, you have um, greater um, visibility into, you know, how people are using the systems. And um, I, th I think those are probably the two biggest components. Thank you. And I hope that. I didn't take uh, Lindsay's, uh, Lindsay's answer away. So. <laughs> I was going to say exactly what Julie said. Just that. <laughs> no, but just to expand a, just a little bit more. I totally agree, Julie. I mean, there's the tangible and the intangible. And at Travelers, we're trying to get to that data-driven culture and means of measuring our impact and, and benefits as a business. But at the same time, you can't really measure an innovative culture, right? It's just, you can kind of like sense it, feel it. Um, and, and I know that's a hard answer to say because it's like, well, how do I get to be innovative? But you just, I don't know, you just kind of, you kind of sense it. I think you can tell, and it speaks to some of our conversation earlier, but just the adoption, right? Like if you get an onslaught of use case ideas for workflow automation, that's a pretty good sign that people across the board are thinking innovatively about what they do every day and how they can transform their work to benefit themselves and their business and their customers. And, and that's really what innovation is. It doesn't have to be anything scary or sophisticated or, you know, any of the other stereotypes that you think about with innovation, but it just has to be embedded in the culture and spread out amongst the diverse group that is the corporate legal department. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, that takes us to our last poll question. Who is the decision maker for new technology implementation uh, for your legal department? The four possible options are IT, legal department, CFO, or all of the above. So while this is running, I move on to my last two questions to Jack. And the first one is, do you also offer pre-code applications? Um, I guess that can expedite the adoption process and probably cover uh, certain kind of hurdles that, uh, you know, a lot of departments uh, across the sector experience. Yep. Uh, so certainly that is actually a, a bit more of a new initiative at Neota. So we do realize that there are um, plenty of use cases that people um, are interested in um, and perhaps they don't want to get started from uh, scratch. They want to maybe 30 or 40% um, of, the, of the way there. So we've had someone, um, a longtime solutions architect in Neota move across to our products team and she is uh, 
completing the drive on those and has uh, several slated for release. Uh, but the idea here is that like something like um, requesting uh, a, a legal services request for a company, um, that's something that's a really great use case for Neota. Um, it's for accepting um, inputs from a user, directing them to another user to review, uh, and then perhaps having a selection for that user to provide in terms of legal resources or directing the question to ex external counsel. So the general structure is there, um, and all that's left for you to do uh, is import it into your what we call our workbench, and then make those minor changes or perhaps substantial changes to make it really specific to your organization. Um, so that, those are certainly slated for release uh, in the next couple of neotological releases. Thank you, Jack. And just to summarize a lot, a lot of what was said today, uh, what would you say are the core benefits of no code applications? Uh, yeah, so um, like I said, putting that um, software development power into the hands of subject matter experts, I think that's the flow on effect in terms of, you know, it's faster, first of all, um, it's gonna be a bit cheaper. Uh, it engages your employees, so it's it's really reducing low value, um, high churn work and letting employees work on uh, things that are interesting to them. They don't want to. I mean, if I were to leave a law firm, I wouldn't want to spend all my time do, generating NDAs for a company. I, I'm a little bit more skilled than that at that point, right? Um, so yeah, it improves employee engagement, uh, and then in terms of maintenance as well. I mean, you're not relying on a team of developers. If there's a change to the law where you have to make your product um, compliant with the law immediately, you can go in and do it yourself and not have to maybe draft up an entire project plan and then spend six months amending it so that it's compliant. Julie and Lindsay, what are the core benefits that you've experienced? If you just put one or two of no of no code, maybe over to you, Lindsay, first. Sure. Yeah. Um, increased speed to execution for any process that you put through workflow automation. Um, that's probably the the number one benefit. Um, but secondly, I think. Oh, it's so hard to pick two. And I'll, I'll go through this in my presentation too. So I have a little bit more time. But um, I think the second one is just standardization of intake. Um, because while it seems trivial by just saying standardization of intake, it improves the end user's experience. They know exactly what's expected of them as they go through the workflow. And to Julie's earlier point, it just has so much value as an output to have consistent data that you can analyze that actually drives your decision making in your business long term. She's she stole what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> consistency, you know, data quality and data consistency is is so important. And um, I just want to make one more plug for. Um, so we have a legal PMO and we work, you know, very closely with our project management group on the design of, you know, every initiative, whether it's a no code solution or whether it's some other type of workflow. And um, I just want to sort of highlight the value um, that those folks have brought to all of our different um, initiatives in terms of the discipline of planning and documentation. So. Thank, thank you, Julie. And just to, uh, wrap up with the results of our last poll. Uh, who is the decision maker for new technology implementations for your legal department? 18% of our attendees says the IT department, 31% says the legal department, 0% says the CFO, uh, and about half of our audience is saying that all uh, of the above. With that, I'm going to end uh, our uh, roundtable discussion and we're going to move on to the next section of today's session, uh, which is the case study that will be delivered by uh, Lindsay and Jack today. Uh, for that purpose, uh, they will share the screen uh, with us. Um, so here, here we are. Uh, I'm gonna hide <laughs> as, 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 as Julie, but we'll be still here at the back. So please address your, your questions uh, in the meantime, and I'm gonna make sure that I raise them uh, towards the end of the case study. Thank you. All right. So I hope you'll find that this presentation is uh, supportive of the panel discussion that we've had today. Um, what I really want to share is how effective workflow automation has led to data-driven business benefits and insights for travelers. Um, so just a quick agenda. 
I want to start by going over the corporate legal landscape at Travelers because it will speak to some of the content that's later on in the presentation. Um, then I will talk about identifying opportunities for effective automation. So you'll hear me say effective a lot. And um, it's important that for your organization and especially for travelers, we needed to define that before we even set out to build any workflow automation use case. Um, I then am going to focus on our anticipated benefits from defining those effective um, opportunities for automation. And then I'll talk about um, our use cases in a little bit more detail. So we'll get into some meat there, um, as well as discussing some of the realized benefits that we've experienced at Travelers. And then um, we'll, we'll do a Q&A. So, I'm sure as a corporate legal audience, you can relate to this organizational chart to some extent, right? Um, it depends on what industry you're in. But of course, our at our legal landscape at Travelers for the corporate division, we have our CLO, general counsel, and then on the left-hand side, you'll see a bunch of corporate groups. So there's this concept of specialty practice areas, and we have quite a few of these, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, just to name a few, we have our contracts division, corporate litigation, we have our, you know, corporate functions that support the corporate business, um, and, and many more. We have our ethics and compliance division, government relations, and legal operations. So um, again, I'm, I'm part of the technology group, so you won't necessarily see me in this org chart, but we partner very closely with legal operations along with every other function that you see here in order to, to deliver technical solutions that meet their, their business needs. And then on the right hand side, you'll see what we call business units. And these are specific areas of legal expertise that support travelers' business functions. So we're a property, property and casualty insurance company. So we have several different um, product lines, I guess you could say, that our legal division supports. But what's more important on this slide is actually the red circles. Um, and, and this has increased slightly from, I think, a previous presentation that I've shared um, this slide during. But the circles indicate the number of workflows that each area has um, asked us to work on, come up with, implement. Um, and you can see there's a pretty diverse span here. My goal is to get to where we have at least one workflow for every single division. Um, we're, we're still working on that because I do believe that workflow automation isn't specific to any type of work. Um, it, it really is just focused on processes and every division has processes regardless of the, the area of expertise. All right, so um, I've mentioned this concept of effective workflow automation. But what does that really mean? Um, as I mentioned previously, we wanted to define that prior to really being hands-on with um, no-code automation efforts because we wanted our definition to support our strategic priorities, our business objectives, because what's the point with working on really any sort of solution or automation efforts if it's not going to impact your bottom line in a positive way. And I spoke about these categories during the panel, but I'll just dive a little bit deeper into them now. Um, so at a high level, we are really looking at workflow automation in four categories. And a use case can touch one or many of these categories. Um, they're not siloed. In fact, it's best if they touch all four categories. So the first is customer self-service. And when I say customer, um, it's really whoever legal is supporting. That's their customer. So how can we enable um, our business partners to obtain advice in a more streamlined fashion? Maybe that's fully automated. Maybe they can um, you know, reference that advice through one of these workflows. Or maybe it's just a streamlined approach where the... Um, requested advice is given directly to the, you know, specific legal individual who's most equipped to answer their question, and boom, you get your advice immediately from that person without removing the, um, you know, person-to-person -person interaction and um, uh, communication, because obviously that is a crucial element to um, delivering good customer service. 
Second is triage and routing. Again, workflow automation is best used when you have predictable processes or logic that you're following, because ultimately you have to tell the solution how to behave. It's not just going to behave the way you want it to. You have to know how it needs to behave, tell it how to behave, and then you can be hands off and it will do the work for you. So that's really the essence of, of triage and routing. The third component is document generation. Um, and an NDA contract is the perfect example. It's a template you're going to use and reuse, but just swap out a few variables. And so if you can use technology to do that for you and to deliver that document to whatever party it needs to get to, it removes that whole step, right? It removes the coordination and the communication, and it's just nice and tidy and clean and delivered in the right fashion. And then the fourth um, section we have here is analytics and reporting. As I mentioned earlier, um, the benefit to workflow automation is the standardization of intake. You can get the data you want um, in a repeatable fashion and an expected fashion. So when you do have the data, you don't have to manipulate it. You don't have to massage it. It's just, it's, it's given to you in a clean cut fashion for you to analyze um, using whatever tool you would like to uh, for, you know, really data driven decision making. So this goes a little bit farther into our definition. Um, so the, the four categories are a really great tool, at least for us, they were a great tool to communicate to the entire corporate legal department what makes a good workflow. Um, and after we did that, after we did this sort of training and, and knowledge sharing of what we've found works well with, with workflow automation or what we expect to work well, we received a bunch of use cases that we had to build and there was no way humanly possible for, for my team and our operations partners to, to do all of them at once in a very timely fashion. So we decided to establish an objective criteria for workflow prioritization. Again, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but our criteria needed to align with our strategic priorities as a corporate legal department. And that's what you'll see here. So just a disclaimer on this slide, the figures here are purely um, illustrative, uh, but they're meant to, you know, show how we were thinking of um, an objective criteria for prioritization. So I'll just quickly go through this. Um, but basically, each category or each criteria, I should say, has a specific weight to it. You have best, better, or good, and then your criteria are along the left-hand side. So we considered how many users are impacted, right? Um, if it's a high number of users, well, great. That means that we're providing a better end user experience to more people, which is always a good thing at the end of the day. Um, what are our resource expense savings? So how much, which kind of goes along with the annual hours saved down in the very important column, but it's a little different because you do have to consider the type of resource that's doing the work along with um, the hours saved if you were to automate it. And then we have optimization assessment. Um, and you could argue that this one is a little bit subjective, and I th think I would give that to you, but what's the, what's the it factor, right? What's the innovation factor of this workflow? Is it a game changer? Um, is it really going to make a big impact at the end of the day in terms of transforming a process completely or significant efficiencies as a result of its implementation. Um, and then you have the important on the bottom. And we also wanted to recognize use cases that had some sort of external interaction. Now, that's not a, a super important factor to us. But again, we want to we want to touch as many people with these workflows and provide the best end user experience, especially if it's a external partner. I mean, those relationships are, are key, right? So if we can improve the experience that we have with external partners, um, as long as well as internal uh, partners, that's that's a win win. And then um, development and complexity. So with a no code platform, this is 
pretty trivial, right? You're, the likelihood that you'll have a very complex workflow that just sits within a workflow automation platform, um, it can vary, right? But we have experienced some workflows where it's not just the workflow automation platform, but we have to touch other platforms like our um, employee system, our DocuSign or, you know, electronic signature system, matter management. Um, so when you factor in those downstream or upstream processes that have to interact with these workflows, um, it, that's really what this criteria is speaking to. Okay. Um, so after we identified and defined specifically what we wanted to get out of these workflows, what was the most important um, considerations for even taking a workflow in and, and building it, we wanted to anticipate or even just think about what benefits we could um, expect to receive or experience as a result of workflow implementation. And, and I have eight high level categories here. Um, this is by no means completely comprehensive. I'm sure there are other um, insights and benefits that we can glean from workflow automation, but this is just what has been in our purview to date. Um, so first is legal resource planning. We've talked a lot about having the right kind of work for the right resource. It's not only an efficiency gain, but it's just a great um, you know, cultural motivator for, for people. Work volume. Um, we've had several conversations with our legal department about anticipated volumes. Oh, I get you know this many NDAs a year, or I get this many conflict of interest disclosures. But until you actually see the data, those anecdotes don't really mean a lot. So at least with workflow automation, we're able to correctly capture the volume in order to address legal resource planning or maybe even further workflow automation from that process. Um, it's just a really good way to wrap your hands around what's really going on within your department. Customized department support. Um, so that triage and routing. Um, again, if you can improve the customer experience and you can give the customer tailored and targeted legal advice via these workflow automation opportunities, that's, that's great and really delivers a customized experience at the end of the day. Geographical hotspots. So again, this is going to be dependent on the kind of data you collect, but as an insurance company, it's really important for us to analyze, um, you know, what's going on around the world and where it's happening in order to address potential changes effectively. Self-service analysis, we've talked about that one. Template optimization. This one is critical. So um, we've talked about NDAs a lot, um, but there are other templates that you could obviously put through workflow automation efforts. Um, and what you'll find potentially is that if you're getting a lot of um, negotiations with your contracts and you have to take it out of the workflow and handle it manually in order to put it back in, you might be able to identify that you don't necessarily need to do that if you just change your template and then the workflow can continue to automate it for you. So we have found a couple of occasions like that and it has definitely contributed to some efficiency gains. Business related trends. Um, so again, we're an insurance company. It's important for us to know what's going on in the business and how we can provide effective legal advice to mitigate risk exposure for our business. And throughput cycle time. Um, I've talked a lot about speed to execution, um, and that's not only just in terms of developing the workflows quickly, but actually delivering um, the process to legal and their customers, um, actually providing that advice at a quicker at a quicker speed or getting a contract executed more um, seamlessly and quickly, that's that's all great too. So now we get into really the meat of the presentation. And I know this slide is extremely busy, but I think it provides some important information about the, the kinds of use cases we've considered um, and how we've sort of bucketed them along with the benefits that our business has experienced as a result of, of the implementation. So before I get into the use case categories, which are on the left, 
I just want to talk about the benefits in more detail um, before, you know, I'm not going to go through every single item here, but I'll summarize the benefits that we've experienced. So first is low to no touch processes for our legal resources. Again, with workflow automation, the idea is you automate as much as possible without compromising that end user experience, that relationship building aspect of delivering legal advice to business partners at the end of the day. Another benefit is increased speed to execution. Um, we've talked about that a lot. Uh, thirdly, standardized and accurate data capture. We've talked about that a lot as well, right? Data is our friend. And here at Travelers, we are really embarking on a data-driven culture to use data to drive our business, drive our output and our results. An improved end user experience. This is key. Um, as I mentioned before, you want a workflow and a solution where it's intuitive. Um, it, and a user, an end user knows exactly what they're getting into, what the next step is, and it's transparent. Um, it, it really just provides a seamless sort of uh, experience and interaction with whatever workflow you're working on. Another benefit um, is that workflow automation removes the need for manual intervention, right? Um, I no longer have to expect my customers to go through five different people before they're routed to me in order for me to pro provide them advice. The workflow can actually do that for them at the snap of a, a finger so they can get the answers that they need quickly in order to work on whatever, whatever they need. Um, and then again, it promotes, Workflow automation promotes tailored and targeted legal advice to our business partners. So we've talked we've talked a lot about all of those benefits, but that's really what you'll see on the slide in the gray benefits box. Um, so the categories for use cases first is contract execution. So this is that high volume, low risk, complexity, um, repetitive contracts. We are really targeting those first um, prior to really looking at any more complex contracts, um, contract automation. Secondly, we have triage and routing, which we've talked about um, quite a bit during this presentation. Third, we have internal disclosures. So this is collecting information from our employee base for you know, pretty repetitive disclosures or, or information um, that require legal expertise or review. An example of that is um, a conflict of interest disclosure. Fourth, we have internal and external procedures and interactions. Um, so this is really the administration of processes to support um, legals, risk or compliance management or mitigation um, efforts. So I've provided a couple of examples here, but what I think is really interesting about this one is that it doesn't necessarily involve attorneys. So these are our legal professionals that um, you know, work on sort of processes that we can automate as well. So an example of that is regulatory filings. Um, another example of that is uh, document destruction approval. So this kind of aligns with records management um, focused tasks, but um, it's, it's a good example for this category. Um, then we have policy related guidance. Again, we're an insurance company, so this might not be relatable to everyone in the audience, but Again, we're trying to build workflows that contribute to the not only our, our legal department's strategic objectives, but our company's bottom line. And this is, is directly speaking to that. And lastly, um, kind of a one-off case, but I think Jack mentioned it earlier, is e-discovery and collection support. So we are targeting um, at least one workflow to support our discovery efforts um, during uh, corporate litigation um, cases or uh, work. Um, so I know that was a lot of information and we do have a Q&A, but I'll just say if you would like to dive deeper into any of this, you can find me on LinkedIn um, and I would love to spend more time discussing this with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Oh. At the minute, we don't have any questions coming forward for you. Uh, and since we've sort of run over time uh, quite a bit, very detailed. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Very insightful. 
I think that it was a, a, a great, uh, a great use for, for all of us. Uh, I wish to probably move on to the presentation that Jack will be doing for us. Yeah, for sure. So let me get this one started up. All right. Uh, so I don't have too many slides to go through with you guys. Um, but I do think it's really uh, important uh, in terms of orienting you guys to uh, the workflow that I'm going to show you, how it was made, what it was, what its purpose was. Uh, so a quick, very reductive overview of what our platform does. Uh, so you can think of our platform in two components for the purposes of this demo. Uh, the first, we have our apps. Uh, apps are going to be your web form. So this is something that we do on a daily basis. You put in your information to certain fields that are predefined name, date, address, et cetera. Uh, when we talk about workflows, which I'll abbreviate to flows for this demo, we're taking uh, web applications that we've built using our no-code platform, and we're stringing them together in a streamlined process using our workflow automation tool. Um, so I'm not really going to show you how we build out these ones here. We're going to focus on the, uh, the flow aspect. Uh, in terms of the demo that I'm going to be showing you, no surprise, an NDA solution. Uh, it's really hot button topic for a lot of in-house legal teams or businesses generally. Um, so the context is that internal business clients will be requesting NDAs from their legal department. Um, the objective is an end-to-end -end process automation. Uh, and then here's a few of the selected benefits that we'll get from this. So it's going to certainly cut through administrative burden, uh, no longer having to trace down an email train, for example. Um, it pushes data into a structured format. So this is something that Lindsay and Julie both mentioned. Um, it's uh, taking uh, a lot of key pieces of information out of uh, your inbox or your email and pushing that into a data table. Uh, and that data table can be converted into an Excel file, which you can then run through analytics software like Power BI um, or Tableau, for example. Uh, the other aspect is that it's going to systematize approval processes. Uh, so you're taking um, what might have been a uh, text and handbook that has to be presented to new employees and you're putting it as a mandatory requirement in your workflow so that there's no kind of skirting around it. Uh, and then lastly, of course, there's more time for high value work. So reducing the need to um, interact with NDAs uh, as consistently as you're doing uh, now. Uh, in terms of the workflow that I've built out, uh, so the flow is that an internal business client requests an NDA from legal, um, an email sent to junior counsel uh, with a link to the client's request. That link brings them into an application, a Neoda application that generates an NDA according to the client's specifications. Um, an email sent to senior counsel. Uh, again, they're, they're given a link where they enter, enter into a Neoda application. They're going to review the NDA that the juniors drafted, and they can either approve it or reject it with some instructions for revision. Uh, and then again, if approved, it's uh, sent to whoever the party is that needs to sign it um, via email with a link to DocuSign. Uh, and then if it's rejected, an email sent to junior counsel with instructions for revision. So what does this look like? I will pull that up now. Yep, got a chain there. Um, so can everybody see um, a workflow right now that's built in Neota? Yes, yep. we can see that. All right, fantastic, because I cannot see myself now. So there you go. Uh, so what we have here, uh, it's our workflow process automation tool. Um, and the way that you should read this, um, so these larger pools here are individual organizations. So here we have a company and an external party. Uh, within each organization, you have different lanes, and the lanes are um, associated with a different actor within the organization. Um, so they're very useful in terms of, you know, separating out who's supposed to go where, uh, but there also is some uh, a little bit more power beneath them because you can assign users' accounts to different lanes. So assign the group internal business clients to a certain user. They can only enter into this web application here. They can't enter into this web application here. Um, now, from there, it's a matter of just following the breadcrumbs to see what's going on in this workflow automation piece. So here we have an internal business client that's going to launch an application with a URL. Perhaps it's surfaced in their SharePoint site or something similar in Extranet. Um, they're going to enter in the information that they need for an NDA. Um, once they finish, they're finished uh, entering in that information, uh, the workflow tool is going to send an email to junior counsel uh, containing a link to their own specific application that surfaces the request that was made by the internal business client. So the junior counsel can then review that request, 
uh, generate the NDA from a set clause of, a set library of clauses. Uh, and at the end of their session, again, an email sent to senior counsel with their own unique link to their own unique application that surfaces the data from these two uh, applications for their for them to review. Um, the senior counsel at that point has the choice to either approve it, in which case it can sent to um, the external party uh, for signature via DocuSign, or they can actually say, no, I need this um, uh, revised slightly, so I'm going to send it back to junior counsel to do the revision. Uh, so we have this looping pattern here. You can iterate as many times as you want. Hopefully junior counsel is a, at least slightly competent, so you don't have to do it two or three times, but uh, that's the case there. It's just capturing uh, cases where there's revision needed for the NDA. Okay, so let's run this workflow. So right now I have the hat on of the internal business client. I'm right here because I've launched it. Um, I'm going to come in. I'm going to say I need an NDA. So what's my company name? Neotologic. Uh, I have the choice. Uh, for the purposes of the demo, we just kept it very simple. You can do a new vendor onboarding NDA, or you can uh, have a new employee NDA. Uh, so we'll do this one because it's slightly shorter and we're out of time, essentially. Um, but we'll name this uh, employee Emma employee for cheek and, cheek and tongue purposes. Uh, we can say that she's a director. And I'll add my own email address um, for the purposes of the demo. Uh, you have a confirmation here, so I'm going to say, yep, this information is correct. Um, I'll add legal's email address in here. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have a text field. This can be pre-programmed into the workflow itself. Um, I've just done this to control the process a little bit more. When I press next, um, I've finished with this part of the flow. Uh, so if I go into my workflow, I'm at this point here. So I should have received an email as junior counsel uh, inviting me to this application. So if I look. Uh, there it is there. So uh, junior counsel, I have requested this new employee NDA. So I'm going to go into my own application. And now I have the hat on of junior counsel. The application is going to give me some abbreviated instructions saying I've requested this for M employee. Uh, and then this is a bit reductive in terms of uh, the clause selection, but it's just uh, demonstrating functionality more so than uh, fitting a particular use case. So of course, there's going to be a period of confidentiality that's required. Typically, this is going to be ongoing, so I'll select that. But if I were to have selected fixed, I have the option to determine how many uh, months of confidentiality the employee is subject to. Uh, again, a lot of these clauses would pretty much be stock standard in NDAs, but I've separated them out just to show the option to add optional clauses. Uh, so you have the um, ability to pre-populate text that's included in the NDA. I'll abbreviate this. Uh, to show that this is a live demo uh, and that this document that's going to be presented to the user is being generated live. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to have a uh, clauses like a breach of agreement clause where you really don't want the junior touching the text at all. So you can just say it's a take it or leave it type situation. Um, so the junior is going to be presented with this NDA. Uh, if we scroll down to the severability clause, you'll see that that's been updated live. Uh, this application is also brought in um, data points that was entered in by the internal business client um, as well as themselves. So it's sharing information with each other. Um, I can say, no, I need to edit it. I'm given some tool tips saying, nope, go back or yep, this is ready to go. So let's press the next button. All right, so that's a thank you. Um, if I come back into here, I should receive a request to senior counsel. So again, following this flow, um, Email has been sent to me, and I'm about to enter into this web application here. So now I'm senior counsel. I should be presented with the precisely the same document that Junior was presented with. And we can see that that's the case because we have that severability clause with the appropriate text there. Um, so now I'm at a, a point where I can have uh, two divisions. So I can either loop this back to the Junior counsel with instructions saying, for example, uh, add a several or add a um, governing jurisdiction clause. Since we kind of have run out of time, I'll just uh, port this directly to Emma employee, who's my own email address, as the person that needs to sign this agreement. Uh, and if I look into my inbox, I should see that there. Uh, and here is that document integration piece or DocuSign integration piece. So um, I'm being taken out of the Neota workflow. Uh, I have predefined um, anchor fields for my signature. I click sign as M employee. Uh, and when I finish, the DocuSign is going to port me right back into that same workflow. 
Um, so a couple of things have happened here. Uh, the document itself uh, is being presented to uh, the external party for their download, so they can download it here. Um, on the back end, this has also been saved into um, the Neota database, which can you can surface that information uh, in an area that I'll show you very shortly. But also, I've been sent um, a couple of documents um, as uh, legal and as um, sorry as the junior and as senior counsel as well as the internal business client of the document itself. Uh, what I was saying previously in terms of where um, the document is being saved to Neoto database uh, with any workflow we have what are called product uh, workflow cards that have session data in them. Uh, so the idea here is that. Um, all the sessions, are, all the rows that someone's run is essentially a workflow session that represent a different document. Uh, you have session states that are being updated. I think I had to press next on that previous page in order to show completed, but you get the point. It's uh, tracking the um, status of the workflow automatically, and then you have this document that's ready for final download here. So that was a lot of information. I will stop sharing my screen if I can. Um, but happy to field any questions with that. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, well, doesn't seem to have any questions coming through from, from our audience at the minute. Um, but just to clarify, everyone's going to receive a recording of today's session who has registered. Uh, if you wish to ask Lindsay, Julie, or Jack any questions, um, you can, you can email me directly. I'm going to forward them uh, the questions or alternative, you can add them on LinkedIn. Um, actually, we've got one question coming up right now, uh, which is uh, to you, Jack, roughly how long does it take to build an app from start to finish? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Obviously, it's going to depend on the size and complexity of the application. Uh, it's also going to depend on your building ex uh, expertise. So I've been building at Yoda for about a year. Um, but I'd say I'm uh, as proficient as a lot of our customers are uh, when they really crack into building out workflows. This workflow itself took me about a day to make um, from start to finish. Uh, so that included automating the document, uh, creating my web applications, and then porting my user down that workflow experience in the workflow editor itself. And a question for me, I mean, would you say that it, it would take about like a year for like someone to, to become like, somewhat like proficient into build, building those like on their on their own or like would it uh, require always some sort of assistance from your team? Yeah, uh, very good question. So we do have um, anytime we onboard new clients, we give them a fundamentals training workshop where we take them through how to build out a web application uh, and just the basic start and finish structure of the application, kind of the web form process itself. Um, that's because that does take a little bit of time to learn. Um, it's really advanced piece of technology um, that can do a lot, but you just need um, a little bit of guidance. When it comes to things like workflow and our lightweight uh, application builder, your builder studio, um, you'll, you saw that it was a very graphical drag and drop interface. So it's truly no code is what we like to think. Um, so it doesn't take long to learn how to work, use workflow. This, is, this tool has been out um, really in a good form since the beginning of this year. And I've only just started using it a few weeks ago and I've already become pretty comfortable and proficient with building. Another question coming now from Nick D. Can Neota handle repeat loops in its automation? Uh, yeah, so I have a workflow, for example, that um, the, use, the, the client was a labor employment firm. Uh, they wanted the ability to upload a spreadsheet into Neota uh, and have an application um, take every row of data within the spreadsheet and generate a termination letter. It's a bit of a macabre use case, but it's something that's iterative and repeat. Uh, you have to repeat it a lot of times when you have kind of mass uh, employment cuts. So um, what it's called is Neota as a service. Um, you push all the data into Neota as a service uh, and on the back end, uh, so completely away from any of the user experience, uh, it is churning through all that data and generating the documents and then perhaps saving them to a database or maybe putting them in emails to send out to people. Uh, but yes, it can do uh, that repetitive looping predefined function as well. Awesome, thank you. I've got one more coming through to my private channel. Can you explain a little more about how your prototyping tool works? 
Yeah, uh, so the prototyping tool I mentioned was called Canvas. Uh, so it's very similar to uh, Workflow in terms of interface, and it's essentially the same idea. So instead of uh, looping applications together, uh, you can think of the squares that I was showing you, you're actually building out that square. And within that square, you'll have your Canvas Builder where you can have nodes that you drag and drop that says, ask a question, and then arrows that direct a user down to different questions or advice, depending on uh, the answer that they provided upstream. Thank you. Another question. Is it possible to import workflows created in third party applications, uh, BPMN question mark? Um, I don't believe it's possible to do that uh, at the moment. I mean, it is quite easy to build out. The, another benefit of the workflow tool is that you don't actually have to have a working application to use it. Uh, you can use it as a, a diagrammatical kind of tool to map out. Um, yeah, it's standard business processing that we use. So it's really useful just mapping out your workflow itself. Um, ingesting workflows created by uh, a third party application, I don't think we have the ability to do that. So that's a how, limitation. How difficult the transition would be from uh, another no code solution to, to Neota, just in case Julie wish to, wishes to swap providers? <laughs> I mean, uh, if you have another workflow that's already built out on a third party, uh, you're pretty much 90% of the way there. You've done your planning, you've done your specs. Uh, maybe there's certain things that you like on Neota that's not offered by the third party. So the planning and all the legwork's been done. It's just a matter of building it out. And like I said, um, once you get proficient at building, which doesn't, I really don't think it takes that much time at all. Um, you can build it out really quickly, matter of days. Um, the other thing to note is that if you don't have capacity to do that, you say, I'm a very busy team, I don't have the resources um, to hire a new employee just to do this. We have professional services uh, that are on offer where a solutions architect will build out the uh, web-based solution or digital solution for you. Jack, in a question from, from me, have you seen an uptake uh, in the past year with uh, a lot of digitization being essentially forced upon us uh, <laughs> because, of, because of the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's been a bit of a double-edged sword because people are, um, it's certainly they have more exposure to all these digital offerings, but sometimes there's a little bit of fatigue. I mean, um, uh, just in terms of interacting with technology itself, but it's from a business, that's from a personal perspective, from a business or enterprise uh, view, uh, definitely it's on the agenda. Um, we need to rely on these technology uh, pieces of technology now to do business. Um, and then it's also just um, a way to sh really cut into a market uh, and make yourself known as like a, an innovator, um, which is useful, not only for, you know, automating your processes and saving all the time and uh, yada, 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 but you're also just marketing your business as uh, innovative and cutting edge. And maybe one last question to, to Julie and Lindsay. Has adoption of kind of more sophisticated technology being pushed up on your agenda? uh in the past year yeah um so i think communication is key like just practical change management efforts you can never over communicate um that's really gonna help with adoption uh we talked about this a little bit earlier but you can't design a solution in a black hole and then deliver it and expect people to love it you really have to make it a collaborative process throughout and get buy-in even before you put hands on keys um, because that's just going to save you a lot of time down the line and it's going to um, ease that adoption process at the end. Thank you, Lindsay. I would just add that, um, you know, specifically over the past year, um, has there been more of a push? Uh, I'm not sure if that's been more, I, I mean, I think we've been on that evolution for the past, you know, five to seven years. And, you know, the ability to collaborate is somewhat hindered because you can't just get together, you know, you can't pop your head out of your office and walk down the hall and talk to someone. It's got to be much more planned. You know, we're going to schedule this next WebEx and everybody's going to be on, you know, so, and I think there's a little bit of fatigue with that, um, but, um, you know, I think that the all the drivers are moving us in a more accelerated fashion. Thank you, Julie. Well, I would like to apologize to our audience that we're about 15 minutes uh, over time. Uh, but in any case, 
Um, I hope that today's session was uh, insightful. I hope that the next session I will host with uh, Julie, Lindsay and Jack will be in the room and there'll be drinks uh, <laughs> afterwards. Uh, <laughs> well, guys, thank you very much for tuning in uh, with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, for whoever couldn't, couldn't attend, you receive a recording of the session. Uh, I wish you all a great Tuesday. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.